I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. In the podcast you're about to listen to deals with a very difficult topic of sexual identity. The motto of Dallas Theological Seminary is teach truth and love well. We're trying to combine these two by the way we are addressing this topic. On the side of truth, we have in previous podcasts examined the biblical position as it relates to marriage and sexuality, defining marriage as a relationship between a man and a woman in a monogamous relationship. This we think comes from Genesis 2 and from Jesus' own teaching in texts like Matthew 19. On the other side of the problem is how to engage a culture that is going in a different direction and how to do that with grace and yet with clarity. This podcast is about that side of the equation. And some of the podcasts that we do on this topic will concentrate on the biblical side of the discussion, while others will deal with the practical issues of how to relate to a culture that views these matters differently. Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss issues of God and culture, and today our topic is a simple one, sexual identity. Uh, uh, Our guests are Mark Yarhouse and Gary Barnes, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but our goal today is to walk through an area that certainly has vexed the church in terms of how to balance uh, grace on the one hand and moral commitments and personal relational dimensions, uh, keep all those balls going all at once is, is a, has been a trick for the church. So Mark, why don't you tell them about your ministry and background and then we'll follow with Gary and we'll dive in. Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm a professor of psychology. I teach psychology at Regent University in Virginia Beach. I also direct the Institute for the Study of Sexual Identity. So I've been, I've been at the university now for 15 years and uh, running this institute for 10. And then we conduct original research on uh, sexual identity questions and concerns people have and how to interact with the church and the gay community around those things. And Gary, what about your background? So I am a licensed psychologist and an ordained minister, so I, I consider myself a strong churchman uh, as well. And uh, I've been here at DTS as a professor for 17 years now and also keep a part-time private practice in marriage and family, of which sexual issues tends to be quite a just common, every now and again. common problem, yes. Yeah, very good. Well, let's just uh, dive right in. You say you do research. Uh, I think I'm going to start there. Uh, what, are, what are some of the more interesting uh, research findings you think are out there that help us begin to get our hands around the issue of sexual identity? Is there, are there studies that, uh, that have helped us rethink or shape the way we should think about the, about the topic? Well, I know, I know the study that shaped, that had an impact on me personally was uh, I did, was participated in a long um, seven-year longitudinal study of attempted change by Christians who um, dealt with same-sex attraction in their life and were involved in Christian ministries. And, you know, it was, it was set up from the standpoint of the culture saying nobody has ever experienced change or change can't happen or orientation's immutable. So we were trying to answer that question, uh, can orientation change? And we tracked people over a seven-year span. So that, that's an example of a study that for me, uh, I think shaped a lot of how I think about these issues. And how did that study turn out? I mean, what was the what was the gist of what what you found? Well, the findings didn't please anybody, and, and you, have to <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand that the, the, the findings are presented in a culture steeped in culture wars right now around sexuality. So, politically, socially, there were people on the one side saying this is an immutable characteristic, it can, and it cannot change, like eye color or hair color. And our data suggested that wasn't true, that mm-hmm. there was some movement along a continuum uh, for some people. But then there were other people in the church saying anybody who tries hard enough or just has enough faith can expect 180 degree change. Mm-hmm. And the data didn't show that either. In fact, I think most people didn't experience as much change as they had hoped to. Mm-hmm. And I think so, to me, I, I left the study uh, with a more sober view of what of what 
what is the likely outcome for people over time? And then, then how do we as Christians respond to brothers and sisters who are trying to navigate that terrain? How do we demonstrate compassion and love to them when they may not experience the kind of movement the rest of us is kind of, are kind of expecting to see happen? Mm-hmm. And it, it, this, is the, this is the area, I think, as I've worked and talked about this in relationship to these podcasts, that is where I have probably learned the most. And that is my previous view was, well, you just have to change. It's, it changes is, is what is, it, this is all about a choice that a person makes, and they've made bad choices, period. But what I've seen and what the data that I've seen also suggests to me is, is it's not that simple, that it's not that straightforward, that there's more to it. And so when we hear in the conversation some people saying, you don't appreciate, this is the way I am, seem to be oriented, this is the way I am, this is not at one level about a choice, it's more profound than that. Uh, is that one of the areas that the church has struggled to get its hands around and come to appreciate in terms of how to, how to think about sexual identity? Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of a meeting I had once with a teenager who was just about to go off to college and his parents, and uh, they were consulting with me for a couple of days. And we were sitting down talking, and I said at one point in the interview, I, I don't think that you chose to experience your same-sex attractions. And he stopped and said, Dr. Yarhouse, you've got to tell my parents because they believe I chose this to make their life miserable. Hmm. And I said, look, I'd be happy to talk with your parents about, you know, theories of causation and and things like that. But no, I don't think you chose this. Now, I do think you have choices to make, choices about behavior and identity. And he said, oh, Dr. Yarhouse, don't tell my parents that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there was this sense of, uh, it's not really a good question, like, like, is this this a choice or isn't it? That's not the best question, because then... um, you do move into those de- debates about causation in that way. I, I think the better question is, what is volitional here? Mm-hmm. What is volitional? And I have really haven't met anybody who chose to experience same-sex attractions. The question now is, what do I do with the feelings that I have? Mm-hmm. How am I going to live my life? And all of us are answering that question. What, what am I going to do with the impulses that I have? How am I going to order them and live in light of them? And that's really the making of how God does sanctification in our lives anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and so the, the stress and the focus that you're um, pushing people towards is to think about something kind of beyond their, the, or that transcends the debates that they have about sexual identity, their identity with Christ and what that means. Is that, is that the other category that needs to come into the conversation in terms of how we, how we engage uh, in terms of helping people? wrestle with with who they are? I I think so. Otherwise, your debate is limited to, is this a foregone conclusion or willful disobedience? And nobody in their right mind is going to say, yes, it's just willful disobedience. And so you you end up speaking past one another. It Mm -hmm. it fuels the culture wars. Mm -hmm. It doesn't aid, it doesn't lend anything pastoral or anything substantive to a discussion that actually affects the lives of real people when you talk past one another. So yeah, I think being able to move towards how do I live in light of what I feel, what does it mean to follow Christ in light of these feelings that I didn't choose and that I'm not sure are going to go away, maybe unlikely to go away, um, maybe movement along a continuum, what's my life going to look like in light of that is a much better starting point for a healthy discussion. So that means that the church runs the risk if it if it forces kind of the choice category as the conversation being very tone deaf in terms of where the person is and where they're coming from, what they're actually struggling with. Is that right? I, I think we end up talking to ourselves and, and people who are dealing with this issue in our own pews will leave the church and people on the outside will just I think wonder why we think we're relevant to them. It's just it's that kind of distancing. Okay, yeah. so uh, that's kind of as an overview to think through uh, think through this. Let, let's talk about the distinction between sexual identity and sexual orientation. How does that help us in relationship to the conversation that we're having? Yeah, I mean, part of my observation, even of the data that we had from that longitudinal study, was that a lot of what I think we captured that was that was changing was sexual identity. I mean, people were changing their behavior, people were changing their identity label. Like if your label was gay or bisexual, you can change that to no label or straight 
uh, or gay to bisexual. I mean, those are just identity labels. I think that was where we saw more shifts than we than we did the underlying um, overall pattern of attraction, although I think there was some movement for some people there as well. So if the debate's all about orientation, then it's all about this this pattern of attraction that's sustained and durable in a person's life. Um, identity, though, opens up a, a larger discussion about personhood, about who I am before God, about my relationship with Christ, about who I am in the church, about what it means to be part of a family, part of a community. Identity, to me, seems like a much more robust and, and more helpful, pastorally helpful direction to take people. Now, Gary, you've been working in this area as well and giving it a lot of thought recently. In fact, mm -hmm. you're in the midst of a sabbatical in which you're giving a lot of time to this. What have you found in terms of the engagement of the church with this area in terms of kind of the tripping points and that kind of thing? Yes, and um, it's really been striking to me over the last several years as I've gotten more involved how the conversation, the nature of the conversation needs to change mm -hmm. within the church and also with the church to those who are unchurched or those who are not heterosexual in the church. Mm -hmm. and, and it needs to be a far more nuanced conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's way more involved mm -hmm. than what most of us are thinking as we're having the conversation, both at a psychological level but also at a theological level. And so uh, there's, there's, first of all, a most important need to become a listener, to become a learner, uh, and to get out of my automatic way of thinking mm -hmm. about things. And, and so um, there's, there's really great new information from both a theological and psychological point of view that Mark and others are making available for us now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for instance, on the longitudinal study that Mark was talking about, and, and you look at the change that does occur, well, it's, it's too simple of an answer to say, does it change or does it not change? It's more, well, what can change? Mm -hmm. like, like he's like, making a distinction between identity and orientation, or the three-tier model, you know, of We'll Same sex that. attraction. Uh -huh. so, so those things are really helpful to have as your point of reference before you're having these conversations. Yeah, and, and it seems to me that the part of what may has made this conversation difficult is that it has dropped into the cultural wars bucket, if, uh, probably mm -hmm. a bad metaphor. But, um, and, and so the, it, it's like your position in relationship to how you're interacting on this topic is defined and you need to take the side that that you know has established itself as the way to do this and you need to do it to to uh to to nuance the discussion in some ways is is to give in you know uh, th that kind of thing mm -hmm. and uh and in the process of doing that it seems to me we set ourselves up to to not relate well to people who are in the in this circumstance is that a fair that's, summary and characterization what's that's going the on automatic <laughs> pilot plan right there uh -huh. that's how that's going to go so so how do we how do we how do we break out of that if if the church struggles with this area and you're you're really trying to keep two things in place simultaneously that are intention the one is you are the are the uh, moral commitments that are a part of scripture and there and we're not just talking about how you respond to particular acts or behaviors mm -hmm. we're talking about how we relate to people we're talking about exactly. the great commandment we're talking about loving god and loving your neighbor and what does that look like in the midst of this kind mm -hmm. of a conversation which is important um, and on the other hand uh, keep that hand extended that says that god is gracious and god can god works in all our lives um, and if God can work on, in all our lives, then we can benefit from what uh, from what uh, what God can do if we give Him the opportunity to work. How do we how do we balance all that? Well, I mean, the, what I what I've chosen to do with my in my professional and, and personal life is I've adopted a, a brand that I try to live out. Um, 
called Convicted Civility. I've talked about that in a few places. Uh, it comes from Richard Mao. Um, I met him recently, and he acknowledged that it came from Martin Marty, and <laughs> maybe, maybe it comes from other sources. I don't know. But it's the idea that we'll that, get it to Calvin or Augustine. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so the the idea is that we have far too many Christians who are strong on convictions, but you wouldn't really want them to represent you in any public way because of how they do it is mm -hmm. just so un it's just not very civil and it's engagement and loving and and caring for the other person then you have christians who are so so civil so loving so caring that you have no idea what they stand for mm -hmm. right so there's this tension that you want to live out and so you know in my own life i try to do that I, in professional engagements with others i've been in frequent dialogues with um, people in the gay community who are psychologists or uh, psychiatrists or just um, I've had you know activists um, like like one con I was making a presentation on my own research at my own university one time and a local activist um, who would identify himself as a gay activist contacted our university and said I'm gonna he did a YouTube video and he called for all of his gay lesbian bisexual transgender and other friends to come and just sit in the front couple rows and stare this son of a gun down and it was a pretty colorful mm -hmm. YouTube video <laughs> so you know what does convicted civility do in those moments like mm -hmm. if it's your brand if it's the lens through which you see things you know I, I talked with a friend of mine and we um, uh, that, that I work with and we decided let's call him let's just you know I, I, so I invited him to come he, he's coming anyway raised <laughs> protesting me so I invited him to you know come and meet me and meet my students and Sure enough, they sat down in the front rows and stared at at at, uh, at me as I was presenting. Yeah, but I talked with them afterwards. He made a video afterwards and said, "You know, I didn't agree with everything this guy said, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was." And mm -hmm. you know, I got to tell you, he was just eviscerated by people within the gay community who felt like he should have been tougher on me. Mm -hmm. right. You know, so he got yeah. more heat from them than he got from the Christian community that, that embraced him. And he and that that gave him pause you know mm -hmm. what does that mean for my community for interacting with these guys um, one of the uh, guys who came to protest me I went out with co for coffee with him a few times and he shared you know he's raised in a Christian home he talked about his upbringing he said look I thought when I met you that you were gonna have smoke coming out of your uh, your 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 nostrils and, and horns on your head and that's that's the way you were depicted to me and yet here we are having coffee and talking about this. And, you know, those are, I think that's what part of what convicted civility does. It's very relational, um, but it's not like I changed my theological position in interacting with these folks. So the idea of sitting down and having a conversation and engaging with, with people who are in a different place is an important part of, of actually um, relating well to people and, and talking about the topic. Because I, th I tend to think what we do in the church is we take our position, we build our fort, we stand forth for the truth and issue our call and, you know, trumpet our view. But, but the personal interaction of actually relating to someone who thinks differently and engaging them in terms of where they are and why they're there, and then getting down in the nitty-gritty of having that hard conversation because it isn't an easy conversation is something we tend to shy away from why do you, why do you think that is why are we why are we slow to engage well uh, let me let me say this about about that i mean i think the, there's an us then them mentality that they're all out there and we're sort of hunkered down within our churches and and it lets us have an in-group and an out group a community we can talk to and sort of we kind of know we all agree on the same thing and then there's and then it sort of serves the culture war because they are taking strides to damage things that are that are sacred to us, and so uh, uh, whether that's around marriage or other issues, and so it it has a tendency to to bring us a false sense of intimacy and closeness at their expense. But even worse than that is that it that whole dynamic. Um, assumes that there are no people within our own churches who are dealing with this issue mm -hmm. because you know they sit in our pews quietly and they say well when you talk about us and them i'm i have more in, i have a lot in common with the, i'm one the of them, them. Yeah. yeah yeah and when you say you know homosexuality is a sin or this is an abomination use language like that it's not that theologically it's incorrect to, to talk about homosexual behavior as sin but when you use language that we often use from the pulpit it actually 
intensifies and increases the shame the person in the pew feels, and it's more likely to drive them away from the church towards the gay community outside that, that is willing to embrace them. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point is that, that why would they stay with the church when the church doesn't even know how to engage and talk with them and love them well? Why wouldn't they go to a community that says, we love you as you are? So the alternative within the church then would be what? If you, if, uh, on the one hand, you're, you're trying to engage the topic, but you're also trying to personally engage and connect with the person and, and relate to them given where they are. So how do, we, yeah. how do we do that balance? How do we dance that dance? So see, I think this is where we need to get more nuanced, both theologically and psychologically, even on the concept of identity. Mm -hmm. See, the, the one thing that I think is a strong motor for this us-them mentality is we, we take a concept of identity and we develop it by how am I distinct from someone else, mm -hmm. see? And then if, if I'm going to be in a religious group with a religious identity, I'm highlighting the ways I'm different from you in a moral way, mm -hmm. see? Or a so-called Christian behavioral standard. Mm -hmm. And if you're not matching up to my standard, then I'm going to bolster my identity by highlighting that difference. And it, actually, I can promote a, a moralistic, self-righteous faith mm -hmm. in the process, mm -hmm. which makes me less inclined to move towards you in your difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, because it serves a purpose for me right. in a unhealthy religious kind of a way. Right. See, and so a good theological distinction of identity is that's really not who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, Theologically speaking, my identity is, is not rooted in my religious behaviors or even my religious beliefs. Or my performance superiority. Certainly that. Yeah, yeah. See? And I, I actually think that the cross is a great leveler. That what it does is it, it – we all have the same needs before God. We may have different areas, but we all have the same core needs. We all stand in the, in the same position of needing God's grace. And I That's think right. that sometimes we forget that in the midst of this conversation. And, and that changes how I'm going to have conversation with someone if I'm saying there's no one else that I'm ever going to have conversation with that is more in need of God's grace than I am. So we come back, just to put it in theological terms, just to justify why this is a broadcast from the seminary. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we come, we're, all, we're all stuck in Romans 3 to a certain degree. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What we gain in our relationship with God, we gain because he gives us and supplies us with what we need that we can't garner for ourselves, that we don't earn it. Uh, those kinds of things, but it, but it's something that we're gifted with, and that I, I think that that's why I say the cross is a leveler. That yes. levels out the playing field. That's not us and them. That's all of us together sharing the same need for God and what He has to yeah. provide. Is that is that a is that a good starting point? Are there other elements to, that make for a good starting point? No, I think that's a I think that's a good starting point. I, I think um, you know when I hear. People in the in the church community who are dealing with this issue, I, I don't think they feel that we believe that. I think they feel mm -hmm. like we kind of rank things and order things, and they'll they'll just never measure up. I don't think a lot of that's really coming from them. I think it really is coming from how we interact as a church. I mean, Christians in the West are not known to be, from a global perspective, the most spiritually mature and tested sort of Christian. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, in terms of our faith commitments, our love for one another, we're very materialistic. We have sort of this um, this uh, American dream Christianity that's, uh, you know, you sort of wonder how much is that really biblical? And then, then you have a young person in the church saying, they're dealing with this issue, saying, you know, you get to go home to your spouse, you get to live this out, you're with your best friend. And I don't even think that most of us appreciate what they're giving up or what, what, what they're saying no to, to be faithful to God. Mm -hmm. And you know, most of us kind of get a pass in our churches mm -hmm. for the things that we deal with. Like, mm -hmm. It's not that our church teaches that what we struggle with is not sin, but we really get kind of a pass when we struggle with our own stuff because we kind of do it privately or we say, well, guys are guys or, you know, whatever. We kind of talk about it in a way that <laughs> makes it sound like 
uh, we are really different mm -hmm. than the person in the pew. We certainly act position. differently towards it. We certainly mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. seem to have created a ranking of there the there are the super sins, you know, the sins on steroids, and then there's mm -hmm. the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're in the other stuff category, you're okay. But if you commit one of the super sins, then you're right. you know then you're marked out. So um, uh, that, that's a that's a huge sociological mentality that you're dealing with mm -hmm. um, that, that, that that is actually in need of some change and it's very very difficult to do when it's that ingrained right. um, uh, but see Daryl I'd like to go back to mm -hmm. your cross uh, starting point mm -hmm. uh, it is a good leveler but if you really have great theology and mm -hmm. go deeper with that. Mm -hmm. what, what the cross is also a model and a motivator. If mm -hmm. you think about Romans 15, 7, receive others as you have been received by Christ. Mm -hmm. So how was I received by Christ? When I was different from him, mm -hmm. even alienated from him, mm -hmm. he took the initiative at extreme cost of himself to move towards me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me moving towards him. It wasn't me getting to a place where he could move towards me. Mm -hmm. He took the initiative. At his cost. Yeah, right. And that's how I'm to, if, if I understand that's the depth of the love and the grace that I received, that becomes motivating for me to say, I don't have any basis not to do that with somebody else. Mm -hmm. See, I have the model and I have the motivation in Christ to, as he was, be full of grace and truth together. These aren't one or the other, mm -hmm. see, uh, and that I would be intentionally trying not to move away from somebody different from me, and I would intentionally try not to be moving against somebody mm -hmm. different from me. Mm -hmm. See. But you 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 really you really are attempting to in, engage them and and listen and hear and and interact and come yes. alongside and be be the analogy I like to use for these kinds of conversations is you're like the friend who cares about someone who comes alongside and says um, what is what is the best way for us to live life together and to and to function in life together and to and to interact, and no matter what the area is, put whatever you want in the X right. area. You know, what's the best way way to do this? And if there's a sense that the that I care about the person I'm having that interaction with, if they sense that for me, I I get permission to engage them in ways that otherwise it would be impossible for me to engage them in, particularly if I'm if I'm mm -hmm. going to be challenging in in part of that conversation. Uh, so. Um, so and I think that's what being gripped by grace does for us. Uh -huh. it, it positions us to do that. Yeah, but it ha it has to come with a really genuine engagement with the person that we're interacting with, uh, and and that means uh, that means listening and hearing mm -hmm. and, and and engaging in a way that uh, uh, that communicates. Uh, in the midst of this conversation, which we're discussing very serious things, and we may not, may not be in total agreement, the one thing you know is that I care about you. Right. In the midst of that, that that's coming through loud and clear in the midst of that conversation. Right. And you, you know, I, he I heard a sermon from uh, Tim Keller that he entitled "Receptive Grace," mm -hmm. which is about this whole thing we're talking about. And he says, you know, it's going to boil down to four points for us mm -hmm. if we're actually demonstrating receptive grace. Number one is we, we enter in as a listener, a learner. Mm -hmm. Number two is we approach it to where I'm going to possibly change through mm -hmm. this engagement. That, that there's the blind spots that I have that this will highlight and give me this option mm -hmm. to respond and change myself personally. Mm -hmm. Number three is I'm, I'm open to being misunderstood by engaging in this process itself. Mm -hmm. So it's risky. And I, I can't avoid the engagement just to avoid the misunderstanding. Right. Uh, but then number four, and I really like this point, is as we're dealing with these differences, I allow for God's timing and pace and change within me and in the person who's different from mm -hmm. me. And I'm not working to have to change the other person to be like me so we can be one. It's mm -hmm. not oneness based on sameness. Mm -hmm. 
See? And I entrust that to God, that process. And I'm, I'm not the personal agent for that change to have to happen. Yeah, that's something God's got to do in that's someone's right. heart apart from me in many ways. He might use me in the midst of it, but that's it's right. apart uh, from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I want, I, there's one technical part of this conversation I want to be sure we don't miss, and we alluded to it already. That's what's called the three-tier model. Yeah. I, I don't want to drop that, and, and so let's, let's talk about that. What is, you know, most of the people listening to this are not technically uh, oriented to this conversation at all. It's the moment you say three tiers, you're thinking of the engineer who's getting ready to design something. <laughs> um, so what are the three tiers? What are we talking about, Mark? Yeah, I mean this. This it's a three-tier distinction that I that I've made now for a few years, and it was just an observation from research that had been conducted on national studies of sexuality. That that when you ask people, do you experience same-sex attraction, a certain percentage of people would say yes, and um, that's higher percentage than if you ask the same group of people, do you have a homosexual orientation? So a smaller percentage, maybe. You know, two to three percent of the population would say that they're oriented towards the same sex, but higher, like five to six percent, or even higher, would say, "I have experienced same-sex attraction." So there's a difference between experiencing same-sex attraction and having a homosexual orientation. And then, of course, we all know that there's also a third possibility, which is saying, "This is my identity." Mm-hmm. So gay identity was the third of the three tiers. And so I was just showing uh, from research that the percentages are different. And then the experience is different. And so sometimes, I, I use this in my, in my counseling practice, um, this is more of a helpful resource for counseling or pastoral care to just make this three-tier distinction and, and see if it's helpful to the person. I don't use it as an apologetic. I don't mm-hmm. use it to engage in a battle. I don't argue with people. But I've had plenty of people sit in my office and say, thank you for that three-tier distinction. I'm gay, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not debating. I'm not yeah, debating. It's yeah. just, but I've had many people. One young man said to me, um, "You know, Doctor Yarhouse, I, I don't think I would take that three-tier distinction to the gay bar and talk with my friends about it because to them it would feel like I was splitting hairs. Mm-hmm. But for me, you're giving me the intellectual space I need to make sense of what I feel and to make decisions about my identity." So that's really what it's, what it's used for. Now, the, what's the difference between attraction and orientation? You know, it's the strength of the attractions, mm-hmm. how persistent and durable they are over time. If, if they're strong attractions to the same sex, they persist, they're durable, then someone might say, that's my orientation, I'm oriented towards the same sex. And then gay identity is usually, you know, that's more of a modern sociocultural label for explaining sexual preferences. It usually carries a connotation of a sexual ethic mm-hmm. that's that's more permissive than a traditional Christian sexual ethic. But I've also been noticing lately that you have a younger group of Christians who deal with this issue who are more comfortable using gay just as an adjective, mm-hmm. not as a noun, but to say, in the common vernacular, I'm telling the world that I do experience same-sex attraction, so I call myself gay. I may be a celibate gay Christian, but I'm using the common language that most people would recognize. So I want to recognize there's this three-tier distinction, but even there, there are differences in how people are using gay today that are important for people in the church to understand. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.